hello this is another meeting hello hello another <laughs> meeting of the visual tools group and today we are kira and vincent and danielle and maybe somebody will join us and i think each of us had some updates to share things we are exploring and planning and hoping to do uh, so maybe the outline for today is uh, kira will uh, tell about the beginning of a project of writing a closure data cookbook, which already has some outline that looks promising. And then Vincent will tell about explorations and reflections of state management in the client, uh, in reagent and reframe, right? Yes, uh, it's correct. And then uh, uh, I, Daniel, will tell a bit about trying to learn the R framework called HTML widget and trying to use it from closure and learn from it. Yeah, so coming back, uh, Florian just joined us and Florian will also share with us uh, some ideas and progress with the Goldly project and I think with the studio uh, part of the Goldly project, which is very exciting a new way of creating notebooks and yeah so we will begin with kira's presentation okay yeah so hi i'm kira um yeah as daniel mentioned i am hoping to start this project kind of a collection of resources for people trying to do data science and closure um so very similar to things that exist for other languages that are more common or typically like thought of as data languages like Python and R. Basically the idea is to just kind of have a big kind of list or like an online book kind of format for um, with, with code examples, like actual things you could copy and try uh, doing common tasks in data science. So um, there's a link there in the chat. I mean, I'll repost it. I'm not sure if when Florian joined, if you can see like previous messages or not, I don't know how that works in Zoom. But anyway, there's an outline there. Um, this is very like just getting started. Um, I don't have like, this isn't my full-time thing, unfortunately, and I don't know how long it'll take to actually get done, but this is the dream. So um, the idea is just for this to be a place where somebody can be like, how do I do this? How do I, you know, read a CSV and rearrange all the things, or how do I manipulate the rows or collect this, or how do I make that kind of chart or this kind of graph? Um, <clears throat> and yeah, the format ideally will be like, I was thinking it would be cool to have those little buttons that we can say like, try this. And I don't know if there's one for closure that exists, but like sort of the way you would see in like code pen for CSS examples or like stack blitz for other languages. Um, I haven't looked into it too much, but I was thinking that'd be kind of cool. Um, so anyway, yeah, I guess this outline, this big massive list of things is kind of where it's at right now. There's a few sections at the bottom. I'm not really sure where's the best place to include them, um, but basically, yeah, I'm just at the point of like building the outline and fleshing out the idea and I'm happy to, yeah, take as much feedback from, from anybody who has any interest in this um, as possible. So, you know, I know there's, I'm kind of on the fence, like there's a lot of sections, there's a couple sections that could really just be maybe separate, like the visualization stuff or the statistics stuff. I'm um, not sure how much is useful or like, I don't know, not, I don't wanna say like correct, but like correct to include here. Um, or if there's things you think are missing, like last time I talked to Daniel, he pointed out, made a really good point about the um, lib Python work that's been done in Clojure to allow people to use Python libraries directly from their Clojure code. Um, I hadn't had that. So like, I feel like that's gonna be a really important thing to include. So anyway, yeah, it's out there and I'm just slowly, slowly, slowly chipping away at it and happy to um, hear what other people think anytime, yeah. Yeah. Would it be okay to share the screen for a moment so that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we could look into it together? Uh, would it make sense? Uh, is it?
Oh, you you unmute now. Oh no. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that that's a good idea. So here's the the links. So this is um right now it's just a repo in the Cyclos organization. So it'll it'll stay public. Um, and yeah. So uh, I guess you know people can have a look. Let me know. Let me know what you think, or if you think there's anything that's missing or too much or too little or whatever. Um, right now, I just had a couple, the sort of top level sections would be like a brief intro, how to get data in and out of a notebook enclosure, data manipulation. So all that stuff about working with tables and, um, you know, changing formats and getting data into like the shape that you want. And then I think probably we'll include a section about visualization. Like this could be a whole separate project, but I don't know if there would be any big benefit. May as well just like add it to this one whenever I get around to it. And then some statistic stuff. I'm not sure. <laughs> excuse me um again this this could be like an entire like lifetime of learning on its own but i was thinking of just including more like examples like actual code examples not so much like teaching you know it, the idea wouldn't be to write like a statistics textbook about like how to use these methods and when you would and whatever it'd be more for like practitioners who already know what they want to do and they just don't know how to do it in closure. So it would be like code examples that they could look at to accomplish those things, but not so much focus on the like theory behind it, um, if that makes sense. And then these are some sections just that I thought would be important to include, but I'm not quite sure where they would fit yet. Maybe just like in their own section or something. So anyway, and this is, there's there's a lot more resources, but these are some for now that I didn't want to lose track of. Uh, yeah. So that's that. Yeah, thank you so much. And and you know, uh, I think there is this. I, I I believe this common understanding that something like that is something that we need very much, and. Maybe Florian will comment in a moment because I think Florian has been thinking about it and also thinking about the tooling side of what would be a good piece of tooling for maintaining something like that. And maybe that is something we could discuss, right? About what tooling, uh, what would be the desired tooling to support such kind of project, right? Yeah, so that's just... a... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think the part on statistics is extremely important because the only uh, the only collection currently where you have statistics enclosure, where you have examples and then a sort of organized set of statistics is Encounter, which I think is today completely outdated and there is much more uh, available now via HTML and FastMath, but mm -hmm. especially the statistics part, there is absolutely nothing documented. So I wouldn't even know where to look uh, for anything. So that's, I think is very important. Uh, what I think is the other extremely important thing, whatever you have, of course it needs to have some sort of nice organization of whatever navigation and, and uh, table of content and whatnot uh, so that somebody can just browse through it. But the part mm -hmm. of actually being able to evaluate whatever snippet you want to evaluate that that is really important as well. Because yeah. what, what I found is many times, even with the notebooks, it's like the code is there but mm -hmm. some of the wrapper code is not there. So yeah. when you want to say, ah, no, this I want to have a look at, and then it's like, this shit is not working because <laughs> something is missing. And yeah. I had this, I had this, uh, the last time uh, I was this week with uh, the Cycloch ML uh, notebooks, where there was some 
some important functions that were sort of unaccessible. Uh, and then it, that, th th this is where it then takes a lot of time till you can use it. Uh, may I suggest something? Uh, uh, could I either instruct you, Kira, or you, Daniel, on how this would, what I have on the gold side in this regard, what could be useful? Every time Florian is teaching me how to use these things, I am surprised because there is new, new things to learn. Yeah, so I think I did get pool, and now, uh, yeah. So all right, perfect. Studio. So then, let's go to the README. Could you say what Studio is? So the. The stack that I've built is is multi-layered, and I try to keep each layer really minimalistic. So at, at the bottom, there is Webly, which is just lets you compile closure script code and build web pages. Uh, essentially, it's a, a quicker syntax to run Shadow CLJS. Then there's Goldly, which basically uh, creates uh, the the SCI uh, interpreter and has an extension manager where you can run uh, uh, where it can you can automatically discover new modules uh, and it has the uh, client server interaction and on top of that I made a configuration that I call Goldly Docs which is just a default configuration of uh, libraries that get included to Goldly Docs, so all the UI renderers. Uh, it is in the Goldly repo, uh, yeah. So you see, if you go there to, to, to Debs Eden, that's essentially everything there is to Goldly Docs. It just says the dependencies of uh, UI input, UI React table, UI HA grid, UI Vega, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and that's it. It, there's nothing more to it, really. So Goldly Docs is built on built on top of Goldly, which is built on top of Webly, right? Yes, yes. Hmm. Uh, and then in go in, in Studio, I just did the same approach. I just added dependencies to uh, all kind of closure libraries that are relevant for data science. And uh, so let's go perhaps into the, yeah, let's go perhaps into the main depths Eden. So that's, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So you see, I have, I'm using Goldly Docs, the most up-to-date version. And I say I use three sub projects the data set, SVG, and CycloGML. So then let's go perhaps to the, the studio slash data set local repo. Okay, so in there, the depths Eden. Okay, so you see, I just add all the, the TechML stack dependencies uh, from Christopher Nuremberger, uh, from Tomas, uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's it from the depths Eden. So I just bring so it to scope. That is a specific studio instance, right? With specific dependencies, which you call data set, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, I see. Thanks. And I think that is so important because there are so many libraries in Clojure ecosystem. You need to have a, a collection with sensible default libraries. Uh, uh, let's go into the data set again, please. And so, uh, yeah, so our studio. Uh, so you see, first of all, I have this notebook folder. Let's let's go into that quick. So let's say, uh, yeah, DS Vega. So that's that's a notebook. Uh, So 
So that uses the, the TechVis Vega to do Vega plots. Yeah, should we, should we try to run this now? Is yes, it... yes. So then please go to the main readme. Oh, yeah. And that says closure minus X stocks. Yeah, so I think this is kind of related to to the cookbook we were discussing earlier, right? Because there, I think, uh, Kira, when we discussed it, we were wondering about what would be a reasonable unit of teaching in a cookbook. Is it yeah. a single yeah. name space or is it a project or something in between, right? Yeah. And so yeah. a studio, yeah. Hmm. So my, my thinking is each notebook needs to be a closure namespace, a fully qualified namespace. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is if it's not a fully qualified namespace, you cannot run tools like CLJ Condo, for example. And, and yeah, this, yeah, I totally agree. This, I think it's, it's really important for it to be like, runnable like that's my, that's the goal is exactly what you say yeah, for people yeah. to be able to take like one of the pages like if you are looking at looking at it as sort of like a book almost you could take one of the pages and just run that like yeah the machine or maybe even like in in some like cloud ide or something i think it'd be really cool to have like a little button where it says like you know run this in like repl it or whatever you could just click that and it would yeah. open up a whole like IDE with all the dependencies and the right files. Yeah, I totally agree. It's so frustrating when you find an example that's finally sort of what you want and then it doesn't work. So yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so this is all really right. cool. This is really, really cool. Cause yeah, like I think basically what I was picturing was like kind of, yeah, like a, set, a series of notebooks almost. So like the, yeah the project would have like a table of contents on the side or something like that. But then each page would be a fully functioning notebook that you could actually just copy and run yourself. Yeah. yeah. You, you will see that this is exactly what I did. Uh, really so cool. if, if you go to the table of contents there, Dave, uh, uh, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah. This is amazing. So go to the notebook viewer. Oh, okay. Just get oh. rid of that message. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So and then yeah. click yeah. on uh, DS oh, Vega. Yeah, DS Vega. This yeah. is so cool. Yeah. So, so what do we have here? We have here uh, uh, the the Red Sing Studio. That is what I call a notebook collection. Uh, it, it is just a list of notebooks, right? And each notebook is just a namespace. So, uh, so just to, to, to repeat again, so we are inside something you called data set, right? And data set is a notebook collections. Is it correct? No, Which, we, uh, oh. on the left, it says in red, uh, on the top left, it says studio. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I see. Yeah. So yeah. this is just the collection of namespaces that are in the studio collection. Uh, yeah, so we are in the context of the studio called dataset. Is it correct? Uh, it is. Uh, uh, the, 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 the dataset folder is... Okay, let's go into, the, into that really quick. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, source, studio, data set. Uh, uh, I think it's called this. Well, let's have a look at this. Yeah, so this, I, I made just some helper functions that I would use in the data sets. 
so you see, I, I call it show Vega. So that's basically the syntax that gets, that's the wrapper that gives me a Vega plot, essentially. Cool. Yeah, this is really interesting. Is it, how does it work underneath? Is it using like one of the existing notebook libraries or is this all your own? This, uh, this uses a, a library called REVAL that stands for reproducible eval, which is producing reproducible notebooks. Uh -huh. But let's, let's perhaps, uh, I, I'll give you a walkthrough. Let's perhaps stay inside the studio. Uh, uh, for a moment, uh, could you open up uh, in Emacs uh, uh, where is it? Uh, uh, yeah, go to go on the top more up, please. Uh, so where are we are studio, yeah, and then uh, resources. Uh, studio config. Uh, so stop, stop. So you, you see here something that says R, R eval a little bit more on the top. Yeah. So that, uh, so here I define, I say, okay, save my eval notebooks to the folder called our document and serve them via the web server on the, on the relative pass API, our document file. And then right. I want to have one collection of notebooks, which I want to call studio. And they should be just closure notebooks. And that should be all the namespaces that, that are in the past of the resource path studio slash notebook slash. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. So that's how that goes. So now let's look into the folder called our document. Oh. Yeah. So, so let's go to DS, uh, uh, what, where were we? DS Vega. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So you see that, so this is effectively the eval notebook format. Oh, interesting. That is the target format that you are rendering, right? Which is generated from that Vega, Vega code, code that you, we saw, right? Th that is, so, so uh, when you eval the namespace, this namespace. Yes, correct. When this namespace gets evaled, whenever you get an eval output, this is run via the eval output to, to hiccup renderer. Uh, and that output is then saved into this notebook.edl file. This one. Yes. Interesting, yeah. And then this is what gets turned into the HTML page. And this is what is being loaded by the viewer when it wants to show something. Right. That's really cool. And and so uh, if you go if you go one more uh, uh, one second, let me see. So can, uh, that is the collection of notebooks you were talking about, right? Which we saw yes, exactly. in the UI. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, can you please delete all this, everything that is in our document, all these folders? Can you delete them? Yeah. Okay. And now we need to go to the readme again. So what you need to do is closure minus X and B eval. Yeah, so I, I'll open another terminal and closure minus X and B eval, right? Yeah. Okay. 
So what this will do is the configuration has defined uh, the collection of notebooks and it has defined the uh, uh, the path where notebooks, eval notebooks should be stored to. So it will now pass it to the evaluator for each document and uh, uh, yeah, and then it will will stop. Oh, so we can go back to this uh, directory uh, here and we see them just regenerated, right? Yes. Oh, I see. So that is the rendering process. Uh, no, it is the recalculate. It's, it is recalculate. one possible yep. calculation process. You could you could do, you could trigger everything of that in the browser, and you could make changes in the browser as well. So, should we go to the browser and see see yes, that? Sure, sure. Let Let's just wait till this is finished. Otherwise, yeah. Or, or or yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so the idea of this is the studio. You started the studio and you had the list of all these notebooks already evaluated, and you could already view it without having a clue what's going on, right? So that is sort of the, this sort of static rendering. Yeah, you see, so you see if you click some of in the bottom, click one of the, the very last. So you see that it says not evaluated. So you have a source code for that, but that source code hasn't yet been evaluated because we deleted all the pre-evaluated notebooks. That is nice. And then if we go to correlation, it is, it has been evaluated. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so now we are probably computing one of those which are slow, right? So that is- uh, Possibly, I think, I think uh, well, go, go to the, go to the, uh, the command line where you started that. Yeah, ML model, right? Yeah. You're telling they would take time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now let's go to the browser. And uh, let's go to the main root. Uh, uh, and then the menu go to uh, uh, REPL. So yeah. Okay, so let's get, go to the DS Vega. Okay, so now you have the REPL view and let's eval the first expression. So you, you put the, the, the cursor yeah, here and you press control enter. I did press control enter. Maybe something is blocking on my side. Oh, oh, it did evaluate. Yeah. Yeah. So you have evaluated that expression. Let's, let's evaluate the next one. And now let's evaluate the last expression. Oh, nice. Yeah? yeah. So what is the idea of this? Well, let's 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 make a change perhaps. Let's call it uh let's change the title from stock price. Let's just remove the 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 price of this. No, no, in in the Vega time series, let's just change the title a little bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Test. All right. So let's eval that again. Okay. And the plot. Test. Yeah. All right. So that was the, the eval one by one and now please call save yeah did you click okay and now call l n b eval yeah all right so if you now go to the folder r studio uh, sorry r document in the in emacs or wherever uh -huh. Uh, yeah, here we are have in, the, in the R document studio notebook. Yeah, and then DS Vega. 
test. And now we should yeah, see I that. Yeah. Yeah. So this quick action did recreate this document. Yes. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, so um, maybe, Florian, maybe it is a good time to kind of converge and maybe conclude this part, and then we can discuss later, and we want also to discuss the cookbook outline further, I guess. Um, so is it is there anything else you want to say about this now? Um, or show anything else or direct me somewhere? Or... So, so uh, that's that's pretty much it. So uh, for my own work, what I need all the time is uh, I want to have a look. I want to be able to play in the browser. So first of all, I want to calculate a few reports, right? Uh, and each report is a closure namespace, so I just use that for it. Uh, so that way I can run whatever once a day, certain updates, and see, okay, how many, how many stocks do I have in my stock database? Uh, uh, yeah, certain calculations. So I can use the notebooks to have calculations that are recurring and where I occasionally want to see like something like a report. That's that's where I think this sort of viewer is uh, essential. Uh, but then I also want to play around with these things in the browser. And for that thing, I have this sort of REPL view. That is great. Yeah, those, yeah, anyway, yeah. And you for see, what yeah. Kira wants to do, you could go, so the, this entire browser, this is like a 200 line uh, SCI closure script code that you could change and do something entirely different to, to, do, to do a dynamic table of content or, to make only certain models available or whatever. Uh, it, it doesn't matter because you have the full closure script that closure script brings, but completely dynamically interpretable via the SCI interpreter. Yeah. Yeah, really cool. And maybe since we are already here, maybe another detail we could mention is that uh, when you uh, when you have something to be visualized, here in your notebook, you don't need to say, this is Vega. Mm -hmm. Somehow, here on the user side notebook, it is already known that this function would return something which is Vega. Yes, right? correct, correct. And, and these are the details that, you know, some of us are, care about a little bit because we are wondering, okay, what would happen if a user takes this and wishes to try it in another tool? Would it be cut, cut and paste friendly as Carsten calls it, right? And maybe those details are something we, we are hoping to discuss more, right? Yeah, well, that's, what... that's really cool. Like you don't, you're not writing out the Vega specification anywhere, right? You just pass like a, a tablecloth data set to this show Vega function and it kind of magically knows what to do with it. So, yeah, I mean, we, we've seen the definition of that function earlier, no? Right, and you're saying so, it's the time series. Yeah, that's really cool. So Vega time series is coming from this uh, tech viz library of Chris, right? Correct. And show Vega is the function that you showed us earlier, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, I'm looking for where it was. I don't remember. Uh, it is in studio, uh, so, uh, in the studio folder, source studio. Uh, I'm sorry, in the data set folder. Uh, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
dataset source studio dataset service oh yeah so here you're beginning with the techml dataset and oh but that that doesn't matter to this show vega yeah oh, to this okay. function doesn't matter yeah. so show vega is just a way to to make sure you're using this element on the client side this com vega component on the client side yes yeah. yeah and these are the details that you know we care about a little bit and we continue discussing and you know in my opinion this is may maybe one of those things that we should figure out before we are hoping to to make any cookbook public right because that is what would make it cut and paste friendly or not yeah 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 i agree yeah but yeah. but uh, uh what what should be possible it should be possible to uh either build a branch of goldly that does not bring this client server part and then you could have just a binary and tell it which bind which which notebook this Eden notebook to load uh uh or you do the same on uh, on uh, what is it uh, uh, skittle for example yeah mm. wonderful yeah so uh, maybe um do, do, do you want to go really quick on demo goldly because it has some it has some other sample notebooks a little bit differently organized but would fit nice to the context of what Kira wants to achieve. Yeah, I, th I think we have time. Yeah, so yeah, let us do it for a moment. So then please make a pull on the demo Goldly. Demo Goldly, okay, cool. Mm, yeah, I did pull and maybe I'll, uh, well, study. yeah, anyway. You could go to the readme or uh, to see how to start it. It's the same thing, closure minus X docs. So this is another project not organized by this studio method, right? But the build, uh, still built on top of Goldly. Yes, yes. So the idea of this is, so what Goldly allows you to do is to build web pages or web apps, similar how you can do it in Shiny. So the, the purpose of demo Goldly is to explain you how to do that. And- Could you mention what Shiny is? It, it, this is this tool from R that uh, allows you to uh, build sort of dynamic apps in R just using R code. Yeah. Oh. Ah, uh, you need to you need to stop the other. Yeah. The other REPL that runs the, yeah, the where, studio. Where did I put it? Yeah. So you see, in this case now, does CLJ require of fortune cookies and time? Yeah. Okay, Which now are, go to the... These are just example notebooks, right? No, uh, go to the go to the local yeah. host, please. Local host 8080. Uh, in the menu, uh, perhaps, can you make it a little bigger, the entire thing? Yeah, go to fortune cookie. And... So th that is just the... So the entire UI that you see there is made in the demo Goldly. So So in here you are on the server side closure code. Yeah. And if you go to yeah. So you see that this let's let's change it really quick. Uh Let's call it uh, Cycloge Cookies, the text perhaps. So you save it and then. Oh, live reload. 
Yeah. 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 That is nice. Yeah, thank you. Uh, fantastic. So enlightening. And and maybe, uh, Florian, any comments to conclude this part? Uh, so I think this, this organization, how I did it in studio, uh, I think that's the way how Kira's cookbook should be built, uh, where perhaps you have multiple Debs Eden projects, each with their own dependencies, and in there, the different namespaces that should be the notebooks. Uh, uh, that is what I think uh, makes sense, because then you can really just copy paste into your own project, whatever makes sense if you want to use it. Or you could change different, uh, 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 you could include different uh, sub projects on demand, which perhaps sometimes you don't want to include. Uh, perhaps the, the lib Python CLJ is a good example for that. Uh, if you don't have the Python environment installed, then you would choose not to run this part of it. So uh, can you go to the uh, really quick to the readme of studio? Maybe later, I guess. Sure, uh, sure. Because, uh, yeah, let, let us maybe maybe zoom out for a moment. And it would be great to dive in later if uh, yeah. some time remains. And uh, thank you so much for this. Um, so um, we are now one hour in the meeting and getting late uh, on some places. Um, then let us think uh, maybe, it, maybe what we could do is to zoom out back to the cookbook and see if uh, Kira, if you have further comments about uh, the plans of the cookbook, about how you would like to see people contributing or anything about the coming process you're envisioning and maybe some thoughts for, for later discussion of of the tooling part, of what you're hoping to see on the tooling part that would kind of make sense for the cookbook, right? And then we'll go to Vincent's uh, 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 update. Is it good? Yeah, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess there's really, there's like two parts. There's the actual content of the sort of documents or whatever, and then there's, yeah, like you said, all this tooling and how we're gonna actually publish it, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think I don't know if I have any new thoughts like really settled yet, but um, I think this is really cool. This is basically like the goal. What I want to do is is yeah, have some way. So if, if you imagine you were like reading a page, reading one of the notebooks, um, that you could just there would be a little button at the bottom that you could click to say like open this up in you know our studio or whatever, like some hosted version of it, so that you can like try it out just as you see it there and then also ideally that would help us have ver like examples that actually work that's something else that i'm trying to figure out is like how to somehow test things or um i don't know if there's sane ways to automate it or what but ideally this book will be valid for more than like six months you know like as things change the goal is to be able to update things and then have some, I don't know exactly what it would look like, but some sort of test suite to ch check that the examples are still valid and still work because that's annoying too, right? When you copy a project, like you said, and then it doesn't run and there's something broken or doesn't work. So that's ambitious, but I don't know. Um, that's, that's what I'm thinking of right now. So yeah, so there's that, but then also, um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I don't know exactly what tool to use yet for actually sort of building the like website, like the, H the HTML artifact, um, including all the Chrome, like all the buttons to switch between pages and the table of contents and the little place to leave comments on GitHub and whatever. Um, so I think there's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of really, really cool tools available now, different notebooks and stuff. So I have to figure out what's the best way to put them all together into like a final um, kind of, you know, it pub pub publishable thing on the internet basically. So, but yeah, yeah. so anyway, I guess all that to say, um, 
sorry, I have a fussy puppy in here. Um, you know, if I'm certainly open to feedback on the, the contents of the book, so the, the outline and the topics and whatever, but also, yeah, if anyone, maybe in the coming weeks, I might try to put together some sort of prototype of what I'm thinking um, the website might look like or how it might work. And then we could see how that's going to work. Cause I think what I'm trying, what I'm picturing is like sort of like a documentation website, but with the like closure notebook kind of like embedded where the content would go and then that way that that closure code the actual contents of the the examples would be like just a, a closure namespace that's copyable and executable um like just as is but then somehow that would be like embedded in a page with a bunch of other kind of stuff around it so um yeah that's that's what I'm thinking right now. Nothing actually exists, but maybe we'll try to start prototyping some stuff in the coming weeks. Wonderful. Yeah, then if it makes sense, maybe we come back to this later and have some discussion about about hopes for this. Uh, um, and yeah, Vincent, would it be good to share your your reflections and updates now? Uh, yes, yes, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let me find where it is. Okay. So, uh, normally you should be able to see a uh, log sec in front of you. Is this the case? Yes. Yes, okay. So, uh, what happened is that recently I, I was wondering uh, about uh, what we could do to reduce the need to have uh, for reframe users to use uh, reagent atom uh, in their view. And uh, instead of having the data in uh, the, the database, the front end database. And uh, I was wondering uh, if a lot of people were like me and were using uh, quite often some uh, reagent atom. So I made a pull on, uh, sorry, oops, I lost my image here. Yeah. I made a small pull on Twitter and it turns out that uh, on that pool, if you remove people who are not reframe users, if you remove people who did not have the, the chance to use a reagent atom because they didn't know what it was, there is a huge majority of, uh, of uh, reframe users who just uh, use an atom uh, sometime. Uh, and uh, the reason why they do that, uh, I try to uh, list, to analyze uh, the, the comments and uh, list a little bit the reasons. Uh, sometimes they do that because the lifetime of the data they put inside the, the reagent at atom is matching the lifetime of the component. So when the component is created, the state uh, become needed. And when the component doesn't exist, the state uh, is not no longer needed. Uh, another reason is that uh, it's easier to duplicate the state when you have multiple instances of uh, the same component. So instead, instead of having a mechanism to have a kind of identifier for a component, and then you store the associated data in the app data base uh, and a specific ID, then here you just have uh, the, the atom uh, duplicated inside the component. So it's easier to duplicate like this. Another reason was to handle uh, the state when uh, easily when you test uh, things, but I think there is, uh, there is a, a version of reframe where things are you, you can provide a global uh, database uh, in a functional way so that it's not really uh, a global state in your program so uh, that, that reason uh, to me is not so important uh, another reason is that it encapsulates mutable state uh, inside your component so that uh, from outside of the component you, you can just forget about this uh, state so it's kind of uh, hidden and uh, so this has to be this is related to uh, 
how the user wants to describe their uh, program uh, mostly. And, and then uh, somebody says that it's uh, simpler to write uh, inside uh, Atom because you don't have to write a dispatch inside uh, uh, an on-click uh, function. You don't have to write an event handler that will uh, be triggered by the dispatch. And you don't have to write a um, subscription to get the data uh, from from the AppDB. Uh, so uh, it, it makes it easier. But uh, th there is an answer that came back uh, quite often. And an answer which is interesting to me, it's, uh, they say that it's uh, better for performances. And I was wondering, uh, OK, then there must be some cases where uh, users really use an atom because of the performance and maybe not uh, really about the other reasons. And uh, what can we do to to improve that so that they don't have to uh, use an atom and they can keep their data in the AppDB if they want. So uh, how to solve the problem of performances. And first, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, what is different between uh, atom and uh, subscribe. Uh, in reframe uh, in terms of performances. So uh, they have the same cost uh, and effect uh, from the point of view of the component. Uh, what I mean is, uh, is that when you derive a reagent uh, atom inside a reagent component, uh, what happens is that the component is re-rendered when the atom's content is changing. And uh, when you derive a subscription uh, in a reagent component, the component is also re-rendered when the subscription's content is changing. So those are very similar. And uh, we, we can see that uh, it's just uh, the same trigger. Uh, probably the subscriptions are implemented using a reagent uh, atom, but I'm not 100% sure of this. I will need to double check again because uh, from my memory, I think it is. But functionally, they work the same way. So uh, in theory, they should have the same cost. Uh, now, there is still a difference of cost, uh, but it's not in the way that the component is refreshed. It's more in the way uh, the content is uh, of uh, the atom and the subscribe are uh, updated. So uh, I wrote that, that the difference is only on the work needed to change the content of an atom versus a subscription. And uh, here I explain why. When you change an atom, you just need to uh, call swap or reset. Swap with a function and reset with a directly a new value. And, uh, and that's it. When you want to change the content of a subscription, uh, this is what happens. First, <clears throat> uh, the subscription subscription is changing because the app database is changing. And uh, this is happening from within uh, most of the, normally it should happen from within uh, uh, event handler. The event handler is re returning a new value for the app DB and uh, once a new value has been uh, set inside the global uh, reagent atom containing the AppDB, uh, then all the top level subscriptions are re-evaluated. And that's really where is the problem. It means that if you have a large application where there is, uh, let's imagine a thousand different subscriptions, uh, which, which are mainly reading uh, data from the AppDB. Uh, when I say reading data, it means reading just a little part of it. I imagine you have a hash map with a thousand entries and each subscription, top level subscription is reading one of those entries. Then uh, it, it's, a, it's a performance uh, problem uh, because a thousand is quite a lot. It could be even more in some cases. So, uh, how do we know when a subscription uh, value or the content is changing? It's uh, we call a function uh, on the AppDB, uh, on the, the value of the AppDB. 
and this function is a subscription function. So we, we have to call a thousand function uh, and sometime, uh, well, no, most of the time uh, those uh, functions are just uh, getters. So they just look like this. There is either a get or a get in uh, on the AppDB and it returns uh, a fragment of the AppDB. So uh, this is uh, where the performance uh, cost uh, comes from. Now, uh, how to improve that, uh, I have an ID. Uh, oh yeah, my, the goal is to have uh, this process fast enough so that uh, it is not a problem for uh, some quick updates on the UI where you have a user that, for example, change a text inside uh, input uh, field. And uh, some users can type very fast and you need probably uh, something like uh, 30, at least 30 uh, updates per second to, to react uh, fast enough for the user to have a visual feedback of the, of the changes. Uh, so the, the idea is that if you want to have that amount of uh, updates, then you, you should avoid having to uh, reevaluate uh, a thousand uh, subscriptions. So uh, in order to, to do that, uh, yeah, that's what I say here. We, we, we should stop doing that. And in order to uh, accelerate uh, that, uh, I propose a solution in constant time, uh, but it, it means we have to do some changes in the way we, we, we do things in Reframe. So uh, what we want is that uh, since Let's, let's assume that all the top level subscriptions are purely getters. So it's either a get or get in. And uh, in that case, uh, if we want to avoid running all of them at the same time, uh, we, we want those, uh, some new kind of uh, subscriptions where it declares in advance what uh, parts of the add DB it is going to, uh, to get. Uh, when it is uh, declared, then we can have a system that gathers all the declarations of all those top level uh, subscriptions, uh, some, group them together and uh, do something useful with it. Uh, so this is what it should look like uh, in theory. I, I just write this for showing the ID and it's not going to be like this in practice because I did not do anything in practice. Uh, so in a new kind of subscription, top level one, we have a pass that says uh, exactly uh, what data uh, we will uh, get in that subscription. And we have a content that says uh, what was the previous value read uh, at that place so that we know uh, if the content has ch changed or not. Uh, so that's a new uh, top level subscription. And when we have multiple of them, like this, let's imagine we have a thousand of them. What we can do is uh, group them uh, inside a large uh, flat hash map where every key is uh, what uh, a getter would take and uh, the value would be uh, a reagent uh, atom. And uh, like this, if we have them all in one place, when we uh, modify, uh, in this example, a person, uh, we can immediately find, and we know which uh, person ID it is, we can immediately find the subscription, uh, which we want to uh, rerun. Uh, so we, we have here a constant access time to the right subscription that should be notified of something that has changed. Uh, so that's for the subscription part, but we still have a problem. Oh, wait, 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 there, there is another thing I, I placed. I'm still not sure if a flat hash map would be better. We can also have a, a tree shaped uh, hash map uh, if we want to avoid a flat hash map with a thousand entries. For example, uh, one where the first level is person, the second level will be different uh, person IDs. And then in the end, uh, the leaves of this tree would be uh, the different uh, reagent atoms that would contain the previous evaluated value for 
is that part of the database so uh if we want to to know uh which part of uh of the db uh, has changed uh currently what happened is that uh, we have to do a diff because in uh in the event handlers in reframe uh, this is how it works okay here this is how it works you have uh uh, event handler set person name uh, you send an event where there is a person id and the name and then this is the body of your uh, event handler and it returns just a, a new value for the whole database and what has changed here or do you know that uh, i just modified uh, the name of a specific person well you don't directly know you have to do a kind of data diff to see what has changed and that takes a lot of time uh to to find out so uh another yeah because the idea is to find what has changed so that you can target uh, the, in constant time the right subscriptions uh, which needs to be recalculated so we cannot do that anymore it's too slow uh what we want is uh uh even handler which is giving more information about what uh, what is the intent of the of the programmers who implement the uh, event handler and uh, i propose this new format uh, where we don't return a new value for the database but we return a description of what we want to change in the database uh, so uh, that's a different uh, how to say Th that one uh, is returning a map of different uh, fx and uh, in my version here i describe the change as uh, an effect uh, so here it should be something that represent uh, association at that place in the database uh, with this value here name and uh, that part would be fast to understand if you are the effect handler and you receive that well you don't need to do any diff on the database to know what has changed because it's this declared here so that's pretty uh, useful and uh, this type of event handler combined with uh, this type of uh, top level subscriptions means that we can have um, a dispatch in constant time so in this way we can remove the the biggest uh, performance pain from uh, from um, the update of a specific state in the program and we can keep it in the uh, reframe database but we have to make those small changes uh, yeah and that's it i am done do you have any question uh, about uh, what i talked about That's really cool. Uh, yes, so, I have... oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. I was just, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding. Like, you can do this already, right, with reframe. So it's not necessarily like proposing a change to reframe. It's just a different way of writing your event and event handlers. Uh, yes. Would already, it would already accomplish this. Uh, yes. Like, constant time look up what you're saying. That's really cool. It's really yeah, see, this part of the event handler uh, can already use what exists in reframe. Uh, this yeah. part here would have to be modified. I uh, would have to make a very specific uh, type of uh, subscription. Uh, and right. as well, there are some subscriptions which represent some computed data where you combine multiple data and get a new one out of it. It's more like a derived value. And uh, right. I would need to find a way to make it work uh, with this type of uh, with this new type of uh, top level subscription but yeah the idea is that uh, even in a large program with a thousand entries uh, as a top level of the app data database uh, this should uh, allow uh, something to be very efficient so i will try to prototype it make a test and and see if it works 
I will plug it to uh, input field and type as fast as, as I can and see uh, how fast uh, refresh are coming. Uh, and there are some other uh, interesting effects of uh, declaring the changes like this. It's uh, that uh, there are other uh, areas inside a reframe app uh, which are doing a kind of diff uh, in, in order to uh, display everything. And here I'm talking about React. Uh, React is using a diff on the, um, what to say, the virtual DOM. And, but uh, because, uh, uh, I'll, I'll say, if we can find a, a direct way to map the changes that happens in the subscription to changes that happens in the virtual DOM, then we can remove most of the diff from uh, the rendering equation. Maybe we can speed up uh, how React is working by saying, here, just uh, uh, replace this value, don't make any diff, uh, you have to update it point. And for example, imagine that you have a list of uh, 10 persons and you want to insert a new person at the index uh, three. Well, if you can say in your subscription, there is a new person inserted at position three, it would be nice to have a mechanism that says, okay, uh, we insert a new component that represents a person inside the uh, virtual DOM at the index three. And then uh, like this, reframe doesn't have to make a kind of diff on all the entries of the person which are displayed in the HTML. Uh, it will just uh, create a new uh, person component and insert it. Uh, so that, that's one of the things I would like to do in the future. Uh, it's a little bit uh, bypassing of the React uh, algorithm uh, in order to make things uh, go faster. Uh, oh, another note I would like to say, uh, this uh, description here uh, is in fact very similar to uh, having a database with some transactions. And this would play the role of a transaction uh, where we say what is new in the database, what we remove from the database, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, for example, I know that there is a library called uh, Doxa, which is which allow people to do that uh, with uh, Doxa. So it's not totally new, but the idea to use it to uh, have a performance boost uh, maybe uh, is new. Or oh, uh, not so new, in fact. Uh, there is another framework which exists, which is working similar to that. It's called uh, Hoplon. Uh, Hoplon is using a state management library called uh, Javelin. Uh, which is working directly with uh, something called cells. They are the same as a reagent atom. And uh, what happened is that in Javelin, uh, inside your uh, event handler, you directly reference some uh, atoms uh, instead of uh, referring them through some kind of identifier here, which is a pass. So yeah, it's not totally new, but uh, as an improvement for Reframe, uh, maybe it's new. Yes, a any other question? Uh, <clears throat> uh, one question on the performance. Uh, there is something where you can build subscription based on other subscriptions. Yes. So in your case, you would have a subscription of person and then to select a specific person you would base on that subscription. In this yes, case, yes. this is sort of uh, not occurring, right? Uh, in this case, it's not uh, occurring, but it could be. Uh, it's just that we can, in, in the situation you describe, uh, you build a kind of hierarchical uh, structure in order to uh, divide and conquer. Uh, so the idea is to have, as in, in your case is to have uh, the least uh, number of uh, top level subscription as possible. Uh, so that's a strategy that a lot of people are using when they use reframe in order to reduce the number of top level uh, subscriptions. But in some cases, you still have too much of them uh, at the top level. And uh, especially if you have a lot of components 
which normally use a lot of reagent atom directly in the component. If you want to move them all inside the, the database, they will likely all be uh, at the top level. So in that situation, maybe you will not find a way to uh, group them together to reduce the number of top level uh, subscriptions and you will not have a good optimization. Uh, in, in my approach, uh, it's no longer a problem. Uh, the, the size, uh, the number of top level subscriptions should not be uh, relevant because it, it's going to uh, darkly guide uh, towards uh, the subscriptions that needs to be updated. So in, in that aspect, we can skip directly to have uh, one entry that represents the full pass and say poof, arrive directly on the reagent uh, atom and uh, do your diff uh, here to say if this subscription has a new value or not. Uh, did I answer your question? Yes, uh, um, I, I guess if you if you would go the route with this uh, sort of uh, tree based subscriptions, in the case of your person person ID example, if there would be a change to one person or uh, one person added, then I guess in the current reframe, all the subscriptions that are based on person would uh, be reevaluated. Uh, if you have them all at the top level, yes. If you use a kind of hierarchical uh, subscription systems, uh, you may have uh, one top level subscription that get all the collection of all the persons together. And then another uh -huh. one below that, that will uh, listen to, uh, to each individual person. Uh, but... Uh, since the, the value for the person collection will change, it's likely that all the subscription belows will still have to be called to see, did I change a person one? Yes, yeah, no. Exactly, exactly. See, so so eventually... Person two? Yeah, it will continue and it's going to be slow. So it's, uh, essentially, if you go the hierarchical uh, approach, instead of this sort of duplication of, of rerunning all the subscription on the top level is then mitigated and you will have the rerunning of all subscriptions related to person essentially. Uh, yeah, you will avoid having to rerun all of them. You will just rerun the one that match what you changed in my version. But in New the version, classical but with, with the with the tree approach, oh, okay. if we would do the example with person and person ID, if we change a person, then not all the top level expressions would be re-evaluated, but all the person subscriptions would be re-evaluated. Yes, that's correct. I think uh, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you're working on a very important point. Uh, I have noticed that too, that uh, uh, Reframe has problems with performance. I... Uh, I was putting uh, like hundreds of notebooks into reframe and I had to stop that because uh, uh, it went really slow at some point. Oh. But, uh, the, the improvement has a cost. It means that uh, the, yeah. the way as a uh, event handler uh, work should be different. And people uh -huh. will need to get used to that, to, to write a description here instead uh -huh. of having the very convenient uh, as hoc, as hoc in. Yeah. Um, I would like to comment another thing that I think has not occurred in your study as problems of reframe. Yes. Uh, what I found is uh, reframe makes components, makes the app instable insofar as if there's a single function that has a bug that basically deletes the entire app DB then all the components will just no longer work at all. Uh, th that is something you can fix by, by having a, whatever, to check whenever uh, an MTB change is valid or not, but you still, you need to do it. Uh, yeah. So, so I found that uh, that is a problem in, in uh, 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 I had a lot of times. And the other thing is, if a component, for whatever reason, 
is updating the wrong path in the updb this can create a huge mess which is difficult to sort out so the all the components that work in the same AppDB need to be very sympathetic to each other. Otherwise, you get stress. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. There is still a way to uh, to find when, when things like that happen. If you have a kind of endo system that uh, let you uh, roll back uh, a few uh, DB values before, and, and have a list of uh, different events you can replay um, the events and see exactly which event uh, destroyed the value of uh, the world data database it happens to me uh, on one of my projects and that's how i, I fixed it is uh, i had a specific uh, uh, effect handler not really event handler but effect handler so that uh, I, I would save the values of the db and and test my program like this and uh, with the uh, undo redo and the list of uh, events i could see exactly where i made a mistake yeah that's that's necessary i, I but i find that quite uh, this this makes a, a huge uh, sort of uh, 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 the, so the setup to, to get a reframe system working is way more complex than a reagent system. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Okay. It, that, that depends on uh, the point of view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Daniel, do you have any question? Yeah, I, I want to say, you know, as somebody who is not so used to thinking about reframe, this discussion is so useful for me personally, as you know, kind of a textbook look into uh, how things work and also what practices are common. And so really wonderful discussion. And, and I think this way of being explicit about what depends on what, and also being explicit about what is changing and how it also helps to think about your system isn't it uh, yes, doesn't yes. it help right and uh, have you have you tried this edit script library for handling diffs Do, uh, that? i heard about it uh i think uh, I think I took a look at, at it uh, a few years ago, uh, but uh, it, it was not what I needed to use. Uh, so at that time, I wrote another library, uh, and I forgot how it's called. I think it's called Diffuse. Diffuse was used to uh, create a data structure which represents uh, a, a diff. So uh, maybe I will. I would use. Uh, diffuse as a base to remember exactly how I was doing that a few years ago uh, in order to make this prototype. Uh, but definitely there, there are some uh, operations I want to have here uh, that uh, I did not see in a project like uh, DOXA is uh, really the operation to say uh, what happens inside a vector. Well, uh, I want to be able to say I uh, that uh, I want to change where we remove the index number two. Or uh, another operation where we say I take the element at position two and I move it at position 10. Uh, and uh, currently uh, there is no library which is doing that. So I will write my own just for the prototype. Uh, some of the changes I would like to do. Uh, about uh, reframe is that mm, no, I will not talk about it right now because it's not ready yet. <laughs> uh, next chapter. <laughs> yeah, and I think one thing about this way of describing the flow of diffs of differences is that 
it is so flexible about how you can respond to changes, right? You could decide that certain part of your system may update only once a few seconds, and then it can look into the whole list of history and ask, do I see any changes of this kind that I care about? And only yes. then, on, right? And it is becoming so easy this way, right? Yeah, because it's more declarative. It shows directly the intent instead of having it buried inside the source code. Because uh, the source code, when there is no constraint, it becomes like a black box for the program, not for the user who is a programmer, but for the program. Uh, because uh, uh, a source code could, could take any kind of function and compose them together. Uh, you cannot really easily write a tool that reads a program and tells you what the program is doing. But when you describe it in a constrained way, like this one, then uh, you can have a program that say, here you added some data, here you remove some data. So what kind of change are you changing? Uh, are you looking for something where you add or remove? And then uh, you can show different uh, events based on that, for example. So it's more easy to uh, work with that uh, compared to that. In the end, uh, what the FX handler for uh, DB slash ASOC is going to do is just going to call ASOC in with the uh, parameters, but at least we have one place in the system where we describe the change and this makes a big difference to me. Uh, I am done with the presentation. <laughs> I will stop the screen sharing. Yeah. Oh, could you could you uh, keep it for a moment? Just ah, um, yes, yes. Yeah. So you are using Logseq, this ah, yes. tool which is partially open source and written in Clojure and Clojure script partially, I think, and has this lively community of plugins and such. And uh, would you like to say something about Logseq? I'm sorry. How is this tool called? Uh, Logseq. Uh, Logsic, uh, L O G S E Q. Uh -huh. uh, I use it without any plugin, just out of the box. And uh, I, I was thinking that maybe it could be a good candidate for a key ride to try. Uh, what I like about the tool is that uh, when I when I write the content of a page inside, uh, it maps one to one to a file uh, which is a Markdown file, so I can. Uh, edit uh, the content here inside uh, this editor, but also can edit the content of those markdown files outside of the editor and click on the re refresh button here to have it updated in my view. Uh, so this uh, aspect, the, the fact that everything is inside a set of markdown files uh, is something very interesting to me because one day if I stop to use LogSec, I still have all my knowledge, all my notes, inside the Markdown files. Uh, yes. Are you... And, uh, I, I wanted to show the, the way to use it is very simple. Uh, today, I, I, I took a note, oops, here. Uh, and I created a page just by saying uh, bracket, bracket, uh, name, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And then I click on it and then I arrive on an empty page and then I fill it up. So I wrote uh, Crodinger DB here for another reason is that uh, I, I, I want that uh, database uh, for the front end uh, to have uh, two different uh, form. One is a set of atoms and one is a, just a hash map that represents the content of all those atoms together. And uh, which one? Uh, it depends. When you want performances, uh, it's going to execute using uh, reagent atoms. And when you want to debug, uh, it's going to be uh, just a larger hash map, just the same as uh, what people do in a reframe. Yeah. Sorry, I I forgot the subject. <laughs> LogSec, uh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I like LogSec. <laughs> So it is like an extension of the Markdown format or the org mode format. Both of them uh, work, right? It's a Markdown format. 
Yeah. Well, when I click can... on a section, you can see uh, it become text and uh, you can see, oh, I made uh, this here. So for example, I could write my uh, notebooks here and save, and then uh, there is a folder. Let me, uh, I have a folder on my desk, which contains uh, all my Logsec DB. And uh, I have some pages here, they, they are all marked down. Uh, I don't know what is inside. Uh, EDN, 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 that's something very readable for us programmers. Uh, journals is the same, is a, a set of markdown pages. Uh, draw, because we can hand draw on the top of, uh, of uh, the page, uh, is using a, another format, which I'm not uh, familiar with and assets is for images so here everything is readable for us programmers that's what i love about uh, logsec it's just a view over uh, open filed files and it is a commercial pro project right but most of it is open source right uh i think so i yeah. don't know which part is not open source mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I don't know either. Um, could it be a possible topic for a study session where we could look and try to build a plugin or, or something like that and see that we can extend it? That would be a good idea. I, I never tried that. Uh, so that would be an experiment. Right, the possible, yeah. Uh, you, you were saying uh, something. Oh. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, right. So one possible hope could be that it could be a target format for some notebook system where, you know, some of us like to write names, namespaces as, as the thing we are editing, but the target format could be something beautiful as a set of markdown files with links between them and images inside and some plugins, right? So that could be one way to try to use it. Uh, yeah. Maybe missing the point, I guess, because it is also a user interface for editing Markdown, right? Yeah, maybe there is a way to uh, modify the software and say uh, that some pages are not mapped to Markdown, but are mapped to some uh, closure files so that we can have the notebooks inside with a little bit of hacking. I don't know how easy it is to hack uh, Logsec. I never tried. Yeah. Mm, uh, any more comments, uh, Vincent, about uh, your topic, about uh, anything you said? Um, mm, I, I will get back to, uh, yeah, I will make a prototype for the performance uh, aspect. But uh, in the future, I will try to see how to uh, address the other issues with uh, a project of mine that I call uh, Rack. Uh, but that's not ready yet, so I will I will see next time. But the idea is really to make all those people who clicked yes happy about uh, some new tools. Awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, so I think we should skip the part about HTML widgets, uh, which is maybe less pressing. Uh, I'll just say that I'm studying this R library called HTML widgets for creating static visualizations. And it looks promising as a very thoughtful framework to learn from. For example, it has very systematic ideas about how to define sizing uh, policies or widgets and how to do it in a systematic way across different kinds of components and how to define how widgets update with a change of data and how to do that systematically and how to define dependencies and how to define um, links between widgets where you know you do some data selection in your scatter plot and then you see the 
table view updating with the relevant filter over the data. So all these things have very systematic ideas of how to use them. And most of it is client side. It is not necessarily uh, about R, even though it was built to be used in R. So it could have a closure backend. And it also could be an inspiration for other closure, closure script libraries. So I'm looking into it and I have some working progress draft that I could share some other time. And if anybody is interested uh, in to, even the people re listening to the recording, then I would love to collaborate on it. It looks like there are easy things that can happen about uh, using this, uh, uh, this huge collection of uh, visual components in HTML widgets. Um, I think we are beyond the official time, but maybe uh, if we could stay just a little bit, we could keep discussing our hopes about the cookbook and related tooling and um, maybe at least raise some of the questions like how uh, parts of the cookbook are linked and how dependencies are handled and how it could be made easy for people to contribute. What would be the, the desired future workflow where people could just easily add a piece of cookbook, right? So well, if, if we have a little time, would it be good to discuss a little bit of that? Sure, yeah, I could do a few more minutes. Um, I mean, I guess I didn't have much in mind. I was definitely just picturing using um, GitHub, like the whole running the whole project as a, an open repo um where yeah i'm not sure exactly what it would look like but either issues or pull requests against that public repo could be like the sort of just the logistics of how people do it and i guess in terms of like coordinating that it might be useful to yeah just keep the conversations going like in in slack and zula within the community to you know make sure everybody's on the same page about what what's going on i think yeah if that makes sense yeah so we are maybe hoping to imagine that a person who wishes to share an example just a little piece of example of something yeah. could just share a namespace and nothing more than that that would yeah. be like the the easy path we could hope for but then there are troubles about dependencies and setup right and and i think yeah that is where maybe florian has some comments about what could go wrong when we just wish to add a namespace yeah i definitely would like to have like yeah we'll have the project set up and then ideally if someone wanted to contribute like just one example or one namespace they could yeah i guess that's the thing it's going to be tricky It'll, like I would like to have a repo that's just a collection of like plain closure namespaces, or maybe like, I guess you could have the comments sort of like a, the clerk notebook style or whatever, but it would just be like a repo with the data, the, the code examples in it. And then uh, from there, yeah, someone could just clone that and run it locally and then add whatever they want. Hopefully, like, yeah, and we'll document some, like, hopefully it should be obvious where to put stuff. And then um, ideally, we can have some, like, automatic process to, like, take that collection of namespaces and then, like, publish it as the website. So however we're going to do that, however we're going to, like, embed those notebooks into a web page um, with all the extra stuff around it, we can hopefully have some sort of like, um, you know, some sort of like CI process or something that like takes those notebooks and then builds the actual book to publish. Um, I'm not sure exactly yet. Yeah, I feel like that's probably the next step maybe is setting up like a couple of prototypes to see what we could possibly use for that or how that might work. But um, yeah, I definitely would like to have the, the um, examples and the actual like, data in the, in the repo is kind of publicly available and, and open for anyone who wants to like add a section or update a section or correct something or whatever. 
for sure. And then possibly, probably there is a certain level, like a subset of the cookbook where a few of the namespaces have something in common, which could be the dependencies and the setup and all those things that you wouldn't like to repeat each time again, but right. need to be different for different parts of the story, right? So those could be like maybe a chapter or a section or maybe maybe yeah. it's probably very related those to the studio idea right and yeah and this yeah for sure. yeah i think it makes sense like yeah i guess i don't know exactly what that would look like but probably having like a separate yeah like config file or maybe kind of like project within a project for each chapter maybe might make sense because i think that's where you would have different dependencies um probably would be more like accumulating dependencies as you go through the book. But that way, if you wanted to clone, yeah, I don't know. I guess you can, I mean, you can have multiple projects in the same repo. So maybe kind of like a mono, like a super repo with like a project for each chapter or something like that could work. And then, yeah, have some tooling to kind of put it all together and publish it as one big website is the dream. Anyway, that's the goal, but I have to play around with some of that stuff in the, in the next coming weeks. Yeah. That would be great. And yeah, uh, do, do we have any, any more comments or thoughts before we say goodbye to the recording? Um, perhaps I want to say something about your HTML widget. Uh study session. So I think that's good. You uh, absolutely right because they have they have collected uh, uh, it's a very good list of, of important visualization components that you can find there. So that's the, that's the good part. Uh, I agree with you that they did put in a lot of work to uh, uh, conceptually uh, what's important, uh, as you said, with the size and so on. So there is a lot to be learned from there. Uh, I think there are, uh, 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 it is not, it is not possible to actually take a lot of the code from any of the HTML widget, uh, libraries, uh, for two reasons. One reason is that, uh, the HTML widgets predominantly work with uh, without uh, React. So I think when you start today with uh, Reagent, you want to stay on Reagent wherever possible. Uh, so many of the components that are purely JS components, uh, I think, uh, you would want to have a, a, a more up-to-date uh, uh, reagent-based uh, version of it. And uh, the other thing is, I think that HTML widget has a lot of problems to solve simply from the fact that they don't have the reagent atoms or that they don't have reframe. Uh, and in, in Clojure, we can, we can deal with all these problems on a level that is that is given to you by the language. So if I think of what, what Vega did with all these event channels and so on, or what Vega did with all their filter pipeline, in closure, the language allows you to do that in itself. So all this additional work that these UI libraries do in closure slash closure script, a lot of that is not really necessary. And the last thing about the packaging or the dependency management, I think that the uh, that the way that the closure dependency management with the jars or the depths Eden, how that works, is amazing and it works like virtually almost all the time. So uh, uh, versus when you go to the whatever, 
the HTML widget land and the JavaScript land, that is where where things uh, break uh, a lot and you have so much churn of all the libraries and so on. So, so I think on the dependency management side, we better stick to the to the depths edel jar uh, approach because that is the, that is a very very good one yeah that's that's yeah, it yeah you know i'm i'm so happy for these comments because that is i think a discussion that needs to be had you know as uh, about the compromises that we could possibly take Right, because we're talking about something that exists today. And yes, wasn't created by the principles that we like possibly, but could just work and could matter to the data scientists that needs a plot today. And then, yeah, anyway, I think it would be, be uh, good uh, to- uh, the, uh, yeah. Daniel, let me say one thing. It is a matter of one hour to add an entire new rendering library into closure SGI closure script and have it in a nice way. That is that is basically not a lot of time. You can do this extremely fast. And the 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 problems you get if you go this HTML widget way is you end up with a hopelessly outdated system that that was very much tailored the way how R had to do it and it's based on technology that's whatever 20 years old so so uh uh with shadow cljs and npm uh so so and closure and npm dependencies you can build everything fast and you can have deterministic builds that will work in 50 years uh, uh, still that you can update or where you can manage the, the, uh, the, the, the process of updating your old dependencies to new versions and so on. So I think from the tooling side there, Clojure has really, uh, or in this case, it is the, 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 the Maven uh, Java uh, that, 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 uh, that does the real job which is something that was made from the outset for enterprise software where all these things are important. So uh, I, I mean, I, I'm very, I'm very uh, happy to, to, to do quick hacks and, and, uh, and make compromises when I have to, but in this case, I think it's not necessary because it can be done so fast. And, and the only reason why why you would even consider this sort of hacky approach is because the normal shadow CLGS build approach is difficult to get started with. Uh, and, and yeah, uh, but when you have it running, it's it's it, it, it's 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 amazing. Yeah, perfect. I think that kind of touches the trade-offs that we will di probably discuss in a future session because it would be better to discuss no, after no, we, I'm after sorry, we, no, no, that, that is great. I hoped you would be this kind of, with uh, come up with this sharp uh, analysis, but we will come back to it after we actually say what it is in a future session. And uh, that is great. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Maybe if anybody has uh, like a last, a comment before we say goodbye to the recording it is a good time otherwise we can say goodbye to the recording and and maybe chat for a few like a couple of minutes about uh, what is about to come um so uh, any last comments yeah so thank you so much and uh, 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 goodbye to the recording okay.